Hey guys, so today we're going to spend some time talking about the rise of the Dutch Republic and the Dutch Golden Age in the 17th century. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So first of all, it's important to point out what we mean when we say the Netherlands. Um, so we're really talking about this part of um, Europe right here. So there are two parts of the Netherlands. There are the United Netherlands, which is the northern provinces, and the Spanish Netherlands, which are the southern provinces. Um, so it's really important to keep that distinction because mostly what we're going to be focusing on are the northern provinces. Um, so the Dutch really become a power on their own, really between anti-Habsburg and anti-Spanish resistance. First in 1555 against the Habsburgs and the whole Roman Empire. So you can see that they are um, held by Charles V in the 1500s. And then finally, um, they fight against Spain in the early 1600s where they gain their independence in the north. Particularly, you'll want to focus on Holland, that's kind of the biggie, the one up there right on the North Sea. Um, so that's really going to be the major power of the Netherlands. And it's important to keep in mind that the Netherlands are a confederation. They are not a united country. So all of these individual states kind of control their own power um, a little bit more specifically than as a united country will do. And that's important to keep in mind. And the Dutch really have a very different idea than most of than the way the government should run than the most of Europe at this time. This is an excerpt from the 1581 Dutch Constitution. It says, as it is apparent to all that a prince is constituted by God to be a ruler of the people. All right, so right there, absolute monarchy, right? Defender, I mean, divine right of kings. However, um, uh, constituted by God to be a ruler of all the people, to defend them from oppression and violence as, shepherd his sh as the shepherd his sheep, and when he does not behave, on the contrary, oppresses them, seeking opportunities to infringe their ancient customs and privileges, then he is no longer a prince but a tyrant, and his subjects are to consider him in no other view. So you can really see how this is the opposite of the way most of Europe is kind of functioning at this time. And this idea that the Dutch are going to be a republic is very contrary to what's going on in France and Spain and the rest of Europe. So it's important to kind of keep in mind as we're talking through this here. All right. So I want to start, uh, before we jump into the specifics of the Golden Age, just kind of give you a brief chronology of the rise of the Dutch power and kind of um, the curve of where they come from and where they go to. Uh, so let's just do a quick overview here. So in 1602, we have the founding of the Dutch East India Company, which you will often see abbreviated VOC, that's V as in Vogue, right? And this comes from the Dutch words for Dutch East India Company. Uh, and this is going to be kind of the main trading power of the Dutch uh, Republic for the next hundred years or so. And then in 1609, they signed the 12 Years Truce, which recognizes the northern provinces as an independent Dutch state. This is also the year of the founding of the Bank of Amsterdam, which is going to be a major economic stronghold in Europe um, in the 17th and 18th centuries. So that's important to note. In 1612, the Dutch colonized Manhattan Island and set up New Amsterdam and um, as the main colony stronghold in North America for the Dutch before it it will eventually be taken from them by the British, but and as, at this time, it is a pretty big stronghold for them. And then in 1621, the Dutch West India Company is founded, um, so a trading company for the other side of the world. And this is also the year um, that the Dutch begin to prepare for their war against Spain, um, which is going to be the Thirty Years' War. So as you can see, the major things that really are going to help the Dutch rise to power are these economic um, institutions that are founded, uh, increase in their power in exploration, as well as their ability to fight the other European powers, particularly Spain, with whom they are going to always have a grudge. So, at the height of the Dutch power, um, in 1652, they take the Portuguese colony of South Africa, which is turned over to the VOC, and they are going to be the main settlers of South Africa until the 1800s, so for the next couple hundred years. This is also the beginning of a language um, that is still spoken in South Africa today, known as Afrikaners, um, which is kind of a combination of some local languages and Dutch, um, which is really kind of goes to show the cultural impact of the Dutch there in South Africa. In the 1640s, 
as a way to kind of um, compete with the Dutch, the British pass a series of navigation acts uh, and setting up some mercant mercantile policies against the Dutch East India Company, particularly um, trying to prevent their colonies from being able to trade with the Dutch. Um, in the 1670s, the French actually do the same. So they issue policies against both the Dutch and the English. So as you can see, kind of in the mid-1600s, um, the Dutch are really showing their power, so much so that it's making other nations really nervous. And they're starting to pass those policies, which are going to have a negative impact on the Dutch. Um, then, of course, the Dutch begin with the late 1600s, of beginning a period of decline. Starting in the 1770s, um, they fight and lose a series of commercial wars, which weaken both the economy and the government first against the Stuart dynasty in England, um, over who's going to be kind of the major mercantilist power, then versus the French with the wars of Louis XIV, and kind of who's going to control the Spanish Netherlands. Um, then in 17, or 1688, the Glorious Revolution takes place in England, where the Dutch stadtholder William III and his wife Mary leave the Netherlands in order to assume the crown of England, which is when they lose one of their major leaders, as you can imagine, would be a major impact. And then, in 1715, the Treaty of Utrecht is signed, ending the War of Spanish Succession um, and really ending the Dutch power in Europe. At this point, the British are going to become kind of the major mercantilist power, and they're going to eclipse the Dutch, and the Dutch, um, which had been in a series of decline for quite some time, are going to fall into more of a moderate state in Europe. Um, so next what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit more in depth into why we call this a golden age and what was really specifically going on in the Netherlands in this time. Mm. Excuse me. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So we're going to start with the social aspects of the golden age. So the Dutch are predominantly Protestant. However, there is a large amount of religious toleration, and so much so that actually people from all over Europe do end up coming to the Netherlands in order to escape persecution in their own countries, including Jews, Puritans, even Catholics. Women um, in Dutch colonies are considered relatively equal. They can own their own businesses and run their own trades, um, which is something that they are not able to do in the rest of the world. Um, and in terms of who is in charge of the economy, it is going to be a economy run by the merchant class. The nobility is not really existent as much um, in terms of who is in control and who is dominant. So just kind of some quick pictures here for you. Um, this is a or a painting rather of one of the Dutch cities of Dordrecht um, in the 1650s, and this is a great picture because what this really shows you is that trading sort of aspect. Um, a lot of the paintings are like this, where you see the city on the sea here, the ships, um, and you know the Netherlands are basically a swamp anyway um, that they kind of had to build up themselves, and so it really kind of goes to show that Protestant work ethic of the Dutch. So this is a photograph of the Oudkerk, or the Old Church in Amsterdam. It was first built in the 1300s, um, which it has been added to and repaired several times since then, um, but has kind of become a symbol of Protestantism and religious toleration in the Netherlands. Um, this is a Emmanuel de Witt painting on the inside of the Oudkerk. Um, as you can see, very plain, not a lot of that Catholic decor um, or Anglican decoration. The, church, the Dutch are very simple, very straightforward. You know, religion plays a big role, and they're very plain and simple kind of religious people. You know, they're not all into the fancy um, rituals and rites. It's just, you know, I love God, and then I go to work, right? And that's really what we see here. Um, so, as I said, Catholics are tolerated um, as long as they're kind of in secret. So this is actually what we call a hidden church. So um, Catholics could meet in the attic in this church or in this building up here in the 1300s. Um, so again, as long as they're not publicizing their faith, everything's kind of cool, right? You know, there is some limits. Um, it's not 100% toleration, but it's still something that you are going to see happening. 
Uh, this is another DeWitt painting, so same guy, um, who's painting the interior of a Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. Um, so there is, like I said, a Jewish population where they escaped from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and Portugal during the Inquisition. A lot of them ended up in the Netherlands, um, so this just kind of goes to show that. A lot of um, Judaism symbols and things show up in the artwork, so here's the interior of a synagogue. Uh, this is a painting by Rembrandt, uh, so one of the most famous Dutch painters in 1650s who painted the portrait of a Jewish man, um, just to kind of show some of the influence of religion on the artwork during this time period. Uh, as I said before, one of the things that they are really all about in the Netherlands are plain and simple people, right? Um, luxury is kind of considered the ultimate sin, um, and this is a great picture to show that. So when you look at this painting, a lot of the Dutch paintings from this period have huge amounts of symbolism in them, um, and you can see that here. And this is the idea that you know, if you are involved in luxury and wealth, then basically it's just this raunchy, you know, debacle, right? This basic orgy of everything, and it's just not going to get right for you. Um, so this is kind of a warning sign for that. Uh, however, that is not to say that there were not some very well-to-do people in Amsterdam, and you can see the very elaborate housing, um, very specific form of architecture that the Dutch have going for them. Um, so these are just some of the upper class homes. Um, these are some of the merchant class homes along the canal. Um, so you can see they're a little bit more simple, a little bit more plain. Um, you're going to find that a lot of the upper classes are Catholic, while the lower and middle classes are going to be the Protestant classes. So they're kind of, that shows the difference in society as well. Um, this is a painting of a burger who is basically a merchant and his daughter. Um, you see this kind of thing cropping up a lot in Dutch paintings, the, you know, trying to emphasize the importance of the working man and the merchant and that sort of thing. Um, so again, um, a young woman with a water jug, again, that kind of plain and simple sort of idea. Vermeer is a really important artist. We're going to talk more about him in just a minute. Uh, this is probably one of the most important paintings to come out of the Netherlands at this time. This is actually called the Dutch Mona Lisa, Girl with a Pearl Earring. You may have seen it before, also a Vermeer painting. Um, but again, it just kind of goes to show the plain spokenness of the Dutch, right? It's not too fancy, right? Um, she's dressed in very plain clothing. The only example of luxury really is that pearl earring that she's wearing. Uh, and that's really important for understanding who the Dutch are as a person. All right, so next, after the social class, we have the economics. Um, so the Dutch had some of the highest wages in Europe. They are also going to be the major financial and shipping power um, of Europe in the 17th century. And some reasons for that um, that we have here. So they are basically an export country. They are what we call the carrying trade. So essentially, the Dutch are the FedEx of the world at the time, right? So other countries will pay them to ship their goods around the world, and they have some of the lowest shipping rates. So they're exporting things like diamonds, litter, and pottery, paintings, silks, all kinds of things. Um, and because they have such a high economy, their inflation is really low, which means that it's really easy for other people even outside of the Netherlands to get loans and to use the Dutch economy to their advantage as well. Uh, so the, um, the VOC and the West India Company are shipping things all over the world. So you can see from this map here, um, everything kind of starts up here in the Netherlands, but they're going everywhere. They're going to the New World. They're going Africa, Asia, um, Indonesia. In fact, um, Australia, you will notice, is called New Holland. It was controlled by the Dutch before the English get in control of it. In fact, many of the colonies we think of as English colonies are actually controlled by the Dutch. And if you look at this map, you can see they're trading in tobacco, sugar, wool, copper, um, spices, porcelain, silks. I mean, these are the big goods that everybody wants. And so that's really important during this period. Um, so just some other things that we have here. Uh, this is a Dutch East India Company ship. Um, just, I think this is a great picture. You'll see a lot of these very colorful kind of um, ships that are used by the Dutch. 
in this time period. Uh, but the Dutch are everywhere, and the ships are definitely recognized as being the biggest and the most powerful. Um, you can see in this painting, there's a lot of power emphasized in the back of this painting, um, and everybody recognizes that the Dutch are the best, right? Um, the stock market of the Netherlands is incredibly high. Now this does also, um, when you play the game in the stock market, sometimes it doesn't work for you. Um, the Dutch do have some kind of interesting twists and turns in their stock market, um, which we'll talk more about later. But um, the stock market is really going to be the central part of the economy, and the Dutch stock market is very important um, for the rest of Europe. Uh, so that's really a big deal. And then, of course, the guild system is set up in the Netherlands to really kind of emphasize the merchant control of the cities itself. And you're going to see that, too, come out in a lot of the artwork as well, such as this one by Rembrandt. Um, this is a Vermeer painting of a woman who is a lace maker. Um, so again, just seeing the artisanal work that's being done, men and women are involved in trade. Uh, this particular painting is, an, is a um, famous one and it's a favorite of mine that kind of, um, there's a lot of symbolism in this particular painting that looks at religious conflict. Um, if you notice that the portrait behind the woman is a portrait of the last judgment uh, of Christ where he's basically judging souls to heaven or hell. Um, she's holding this uh, scale which is meant to weigh um, goods Right, but it can also be this kind of idea of weighing sin, whether you know they're good or bad, heaven or hell kind of thing. Um, so you can see that she, you know, she's dressed very richly in furs, but at the same time, she's obviously a merchant class woman um, who's meant to be very modest. And so there's this idea of symbolism, like where do we find the balance between wealth and that Protestant ideal of being modest and plain spoken. And you see this a lot in some of this Dutch art from the period. Um, Dutch Delft ware or porcelain ware is really famous um, and it comes out from this time period. It's one of their biggest trades. Um, so much so that actually a lot of other countries around the world try to copy it, but the quality is just much lower um, and it's just not considered as good quality. Uh, the Dutch West India Company uh, controls a lot of the trade for the Dutch in the Caribbean. Um, so the Netherlands Antilles are their kind of main stronghold in the Caribbean here. So you can see these are the islands in the Caribbean Sea that the West India Company is trading. Um, Fort Orange is set up in what is today Albany, New York in the New Netherlands up um, in New Amsterdam. So this is where the Dutch had their main control in the northern colonies, um, they supposedly bought it off the Native Americans for some nutmeg, um, which is a spice, if you know anything about that. Um, some interesting ideas, uh, stories about that there. But this is going to be where the Dutch are in New York. And even in New York today, you can still see a lot of um, influences from the Dutch there. So much so that in the early 20th century there was a Dutch revival style where some of the buildings in New York were built in that very Dutch style. Um, so you definitely still have that idea of that Protestant work ethic and the Dutch are still around in New York today. Uh, now the East India Company or the VOC which was the bigger of the two was mostly in Indonesia which is where the Dutch had the majority of their colonies and the biggest thing they were trading there is spices. They were so much into the spice trade and that's really big and really important to know about the Dutch. This particular painting is from another Dutch master um, and this shows their influence kind of in Africa as well. But when you look at this painting, what there are just some things about this painting that I find absolutely hilarious. Um, and first of all is the actual portrayal of the African people. Um, so this painting is as much propaganda as it is anything else. So you kind of see this idea of like the peaceful African, right? And you know, that's this very exotic, very kind of look to it with the, you know, this lady is sitting on a lion with this little baby next to it. Um, and it's definitely trying to kind of encourage people to enjoy Africa. Um, but if you know anything about, you know, the way Africans were treated um, by colonizers, it was not this kind, right? Um, so it's definitely trying to portray an image of Africa that was not necessarily true for the people living there at the period. Uh, the Dutch even made it as far as Japan. 
So this is a 17th century engraving from Japan itself. And when you look at this painting or er, this engraving, you may go, wait, how do you know this is the Dutch? Well, if you look at the flags, this is the Dutch flag, the orange, white, and blue. Um, and we do know that the Dutch were in Japan and traded quite a bit with them, but so much so it even shows up in Japanese artwork. Um, so you can really see the influence that the Dutch economy had in really all parts of the world, the Americas, Indonesia, Caribbean, Africa, Japan, it's all over the place. Uh, the next thing that we have here is the intellectual and cultural elements of the Dutch Golden Age. So really, the scientific revolution and enlightenment kind of begin in the Netherlands, and there are definitely some early philosophers who come out of the Netherlands. Um, this is also a heightened point in painting. A lot of people consider the Dutch masters, or the Dutch painters of this period, and you've seen a lot of these paintings already, um, to be really some of the best paintings in all of um, European history. They are some of my favorite paintings of European history, for sure. A lot of symbolism in them, a lot of detail, um, and really this is a huge time of cultural and intellectual awareness that is very much a part of this golden age. So, in terms of some of the scientists and philosophers that you need to know, uh, one of the most important philosophers is a guy named René Descartes, who is Dutch and studies in the Netherlands. Then we have the guy who invented the telescope. We think of it as being Copernicus or Galileo, but actually the first guy to patent a telescope was Hans Lippershey, um, who was Dutch. And that is my best pronunciation of his name. Um, and I apologize to Hans there. Um, then we have an astronomer named Christian Huygens, um, who really um, was able to put forward some really important theories of astronomy um, for the beginning of the scientific revolution. And then we've got Anton van Leeuwenhoek. I know I did not say his name right, um, who actually invented the microscope and was the first man to discover microorganisms, so bacteria and single-celled organisms. Um, so these guys were all Dutch and all came out of Dutch training and Dutch schools. So this is really important. And science is a huge part of the Netherlands in this time. Um, there are uh, basically the beginnings of people being able to learn about anatomy and the human body. And the Dutch had universities set up um, that are secular universities, so not run by the church. Uh, and you can see it even in this painting. This is a great painting of an anatomy lecture where basically what we have is this man dissecting a corpse and you have the students of anatomy looking on. Um, but when you look, blow up this picture of the corpse here, you can see that even Rembrandt as a painter has a very good idea of what's kind of going on inside the human body, right? We've got the muscles and the veins and everything. Um, and so it even gives us an idea how much science is even of, uh, going on in the lecture. My favorite part of this painting, however, is this guy right here who looks like he has stumbled into the absolute wrong room at the wrong time. Like, you know, on the first day of school when you're not really sure where you're supposed to be. Yeah, that's this guy right here. So, um, moving on, uh, we have, I mentioned a guy a minute ago named Vermeer, and so I've shown you a lot of his paintings already, and there's a lot of question about how he actually managed to do his paintings, because basically his paintings are too good. There's too much detail, too much realism. His work with light and reflection is considered just phenomenal, and the problem is, is that he took months to create these paintings. Sometimes he would only create one or two paintings a year. And, you know, he obviously doesn't have a person posing for that long. So there's this question about how Vermeer is actually able to do his paintings. And the answer is science. And there's this question that he used science and new discoveries in optic lenses in order to help create his paintings. Um, so what he basically used is something called a camera obscura, which is basically an early form of a camera. And it uses the lens to project images onto canvases. And then he is able to use those images to paint details that you otherwise would not be able to use. And it's a pretty incredible thought. We don't know if he did this for sure. We do know that he was friends with a lot of scientists and big names at the time. 
but Vermeer was a really private guy. He didn't leave a lot of private papers, so we don't know much about his private life. Um, but when you look at his paintings, it's hard to deny that there's definitely something going on there. Um, so, for example, um, this is a painting called The Astronomer. Um, it's actually imagined, or it's thought, um, that the guy who invented the microscope is actually the model in this painting. We know them to be friends. Um, so when you just look at the details in this painting, you see a lot of um, science kind of going on with the earth and the, um, the anatomy portrait in the background. And really, but just look at the detail of the fabric in this painting of the man himself, the way that the shadows are coming in from that window. It's just basically, it's too good, right? Um, you can see this in some others. This is another one of his paintings, The Geographer. As you can see, it's painted in the exact same room, possibly the exact same model, um, different time of day. You can see how the shadow play is a little bit different. Um, the same globe is actually in this painting as well. Um, this one is one of my favorites. So this is called A Girl Reading a Letter with a Window Open, right? Very descriptive. And again, you can see the kind of some of the same sort of things, but the window's open this time. And my favorite part of this painting is this young woman's reflection in the window itself. Look at this. Um, so he obviously has a really good idea of the way light reflects and works um, and the way shadows work. It's just too perfect. Uh, this one is another really great one. Um, so it's this woman playing um, the harpsichord here uh, with her teacher in the foreground. And obviously the girl has her back to you, so you can't see her face, right? Except, oh no, look up here. Her face is in the mirror, and you can see that the mirror is actually at an angle, and you know this from the shadows of the mirror on the wall right here. And it's the perfect angle to see her face to see the reflection of the room, to see things that you actually can't see in the room, um, what's behind this table. And again, that light and shadow play is just brilliant, the way he's got this done. Um, but as I was saying before, this painting took two, uh, three years for him to paint. So he took a really long time, and this is something he put a lot of detail and a lot of thought into. Last but not least, we have the political side of this. Um, so this is um, a mercantile economy, obviously, as we've talked about before, and it's mostly run by an oligarchy. So essentially what we have um, is a relative political freedom, and it's balanced by the House of Orange, who is the noble class, or the princes of Holland. They are actually still the ruling class in um, the Netherlands today, and they are known as the Stadtholders. So they're kind of the individual leaders of the um, different parts of the confederation. But what we're going to find out is that whereas in our country the federal government has the most power down to the local government which has to answer to, answer to the federal, in a confederation like in the Netherlands it's going to be the local government that has the most power. So these local governments are what we call the regents. So they are at the provincial level, so the different states. Um, they uh, virtually hold all of the power. They are strong advocates of local independence. They run the local economies, the local laws, and basically they are the ones kind of running the individual little states. Then you have the stockholder. So the stockholder is going to come from the regions, and they're going to serve as the representative in the federal government from each province. Their main job is to be responsible for the defense and order of their particular province. And in a time of war, that's when all the Dutch provinces really come together. And that's really when the states general has their say. Um, so this is a federal assembly. They meet in what's called the Hague, And their main job is to focus on federal foreign affairs and generally just war. And all issues that came to the states general had to be referred back to the regions and the local estates. So basically, the federal government's only in charge when there's a war, right? Individually, the local governments are the ones that are going to have the most power. And this is part of the main reason for the Dutch decline, because when you're not really unified and you don't have that unifying factor, that's really what's going to cause a problem and cause fragmentation. Uh, so this is just an example of another Rembrandt painting. Rembrandt is a huge name. Next to Vermeer, he is the next name you need to know of the Dutch masters. Um, but just kind of shows the local government serving as the night watch in the um, town, um, probably Holland, that's where Rembrandt is from. Um, so you can kind of see the local government in charge here. This is the Dutch 
royal palace in Amsterdam where the royal government still lives um, to this day. Uh, and this is one of the counts granting privileges. But again, as I said, for the most part, the this is mostly a figurehead. You know, you look at this guy, he looks like a king, right? But he's mostly a figurehead. It's going to be those locals' estates that really have the most power. And that's what's going to cause the end for the Dutch. Um, so this kind of wraps up the Dutch Republic here. Um, we'll kind of be able to compare it to some of the other places we've been talking to um, about in Europe in the 17th century. Uh, but other than that, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.